Today I'm talking to Julie Freeman, who has, uh, is making a growing reputation as, a, a, amongst other things, a data artist. Julie, um, people use several terms for the, the subject we're both interested in, uh, computer art, digital art, new media art, net art, data art, perhaps in your case, all that sort of thing. Do you, do you have strong feelings about any of them? Um, I don't have strong feelings about any one label in particular. I guess I have strong feelings about everything having to be categorised and labelled in the first place. But for instance, I used to you know, work from 20 years ago, maybe I'd just call digital art, but it seemed sort of digital artists were the thing that people were talking about. But actually, in hindsight, it was more what you might call data art now. Um, but actually, all of it, I think over... As time progresses, it'll all end up just as sort of artwork. We won't be sort of detailing the tools and techniques in the category. And the categories come from having to, from, from curators and critics and people in academia who want to be able to um, put things into certain boxes so that they can then compare them. So, and it's easier to critique things if, if you've got sort of like a baseline of comparative. So if you're putting everything into a box that's called data art, then suddenly you can kind of look across them. So I understand that there's that, it's useful in that kind of context, but I don't think it's useful in the wider art world to be so specific. So historically, yes, critically, yes, categorise things, but you know, for, for the general public, for the mm. consumer of art, maybe it doesn't really matter. Would you like to, to briefly summarise your own contribution to the digital art field? You know, what sort of t types of art, what media have you worked with, subject matter, that sort of thing? So yeah, that, I mean, yeah, it's broad. I've, I guess my, my contribution, the, w the way I see it, has been about the, this idea of the... Th there's a couple of things. One is about li aliveness, so the, t the idea of real-time something informing my work. And so for me, naturally, that's about the environment or animals, sometimes humans, but this kind of idea that the work, I see my work very much as sort of, they're quite systems orientated. So they're frameworks that have my artistic input and my, my design and my um, sort of intention embedded within them. But then there's always a gap where some real time data from a living system mm -hmm. can come in and inform it. And in that way, they're kind of, some of the work is almost co-created, even though one part is unintentional. So, for instance, making um, music and animation from the movement of real-time fish movement. Um, let me say that again. So, for instance, making, um, for instance, making animation and music and sound from real-time fish movement mm. is very much... I see that as a system that I set up and then the, the fish kind of have a say yes. in the final artwork. Yes. So I relinquish control a little bit. Mm. So I think in terms of my contribution, there's been a number of artworks that involve animals and technology and using data as this kind of point of communication between the things that I'm interested in mm. um, and then between the audience as well. Mm. Um, and also working beyond the digital. So although a lot of the work is screen based, there's also generally a sound aspect to it and often more recently there's been objects related to the work I'm doing as well. So bringing the sort of intangibleness of data and the, the digital world into the kind of physical, physical domain so that it becomes much more tangible. Um, but I think at the heart of it, my, what, what really drives all of the works is this idea that technology is such an important Important, plays such an important part in how we, in be, you know, how we absorb information, how we understand the natural world, that it's really important that we consider the voice that, that the messenger has, in a way. Yes, yes. So yes. how technology is dictating mm. what we see mm. and how we see it mm. and in what format mm. we see it. Um, why, why did you become a, a, a sorry to keep you, I'm using the phrase, a digital artist, yeah. I mean, did, did you start off as a scientist and, and become an artist or, or did you start off as a computer programmer or did you just start? Yeah, no, I guess I, I, guess I just started. I've always been on both sides, so it's never been one or the other for me. All of my, all of my education has been both technology and design or technology and art, mm. so my master's was... Um, 
50% C programming, 50% fine art, and then the, and where those two converged. And so I don't. For me, it's it's all bundled up together. Oh. There there is no sort of one or the other. So they've both art and technology have informed my practice all all the way through. Hmm. Um, so I think I, for me, it feels seamless. I've got engineering skills and software skills to build the systems and look at whatever you know, create the framework. But then the my, I guess my artistic side allows me to, to use those skills in a creative way, in ways that other people maybe wouldn't consider, mm. or um, ways that make us stop and think about something that, um, that something, <laughs> I can't remember where I was going with that. Um, well, when you started, I mean, did you feel that you were, a, you were very much a pioneer, uh, or... or did you feel you were treading down a, what was becoming an established path, you know, in combining these two sides of things, not just being a pure artist with a paintbrush? Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I never, I don't think, I don't think you ever feel like a pioneer when you're doing anything, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that, that's definitely a label for other people to put, put on others. Um, I think at the time, for, in my Masters, which was um, over 20 years ago now, we learned about people who were practicing with art and technology, you know, way before we started looking at it. So looking at the, the Sulkers, for instance, who were playing with video technology, yeah. um, looking at people like Shannon Bell, who was working sort of in that field. And then um, there was a, you know, there's a rich history already, mm. you know, and the obvious kind of cybernetic serendipity mm. show, the software show. Mm. Um, all those things existed already. So um, particularly Nicholas Negroponte was really, I found him really influential in the early days when I was beginning to understand about works. And he made a work with his students at MIT that had um, robots and gerbils in it. So there was like live animals and robotics and computer software, which was completely um, aligned with what I wanted to do. And he, that was happening in, uh, you know, late, maybe late 70s or 1971, something like that. So I think they were pioneering, but I wonder if when they were looking at what they wanted to do, whether there was a precedent that they flipped back to. So you always feel there's always an incremental level of what happens. It's, it's rarely something that comes out of nowhere. I guess the only, the only thing that's a bit different on that score would be the net art. So before the internet, there was no internet, obviously, so there was no yes. internet art, but that, there was yes. still like yes. systems art and yes. um, okay. networked technologies but so in a sense Julie technology gives you the ability to, to to push the boundaries more than more than perhaps using traditional artistic methods yeah I think in terms of when you're we you feel like you're doing something new the technology element of the work is really the, the thing that maybe judges that allows you to gauge that so for instance with um, some projects the technology I need doesn't exist mm. and so we have to write the software mm. or we have to build the hardware or we have to do something to, to, to make that technology exist in the first place. So that, is, that means it is kind of cutting edge or new and often with work, so with the lake project with the fish, there was no real time um, tagging system, the, they, the, the, the tags, the fish were tracked in real time, but then it was banked, and I wanted the data to flow in real time, so the, the company that built the tags had to create that specially for the art project. And then once this, the project was over, then they had a piece of technology that they sold commercially because it became part of their portfolio. Mm. So those things are interesting to me, the fact that they, they probably would have headed in that direction anyway, mm. but my... De the, the demand that came out of the artwork catalyzed the innovation for their company. Mm. And they're interesting points where you see how artists, digital artists or artists working with technology definitely sort of push things forward. And that work with the real-time animal tracking was the first piece that I'd done and that was in 2005 and now there's loads of um, animal tracking systems. The tags are much smaller, the systems are much smoother. And so um, when you look back on it in that context, you can say, yeah, this was one of the early works yeah. that was definitely doing that. One of the people I interviewed earlier uh, uh, said, and I, I hope I'm paraphrasing him correctly, that um, one of the attractions is that y you get to develop a new language, you know, because you're, you're not doing traditional 
um, art, you're, you're, yeah, and, and therefore you, you have much more freedom to think and to develop your own language. So does that been your experience too? Yeah, I, I think the freedom to... Oh, God, I feel like I have the freedom to do whatever I want. And then that's, that is the beauty of uh, feeling like you're working across a load of disciplines where there isn't necessarily a precedent. Hmm. So hmm. I don't feel like I have to follow yeah, any, anybody's um, hmm. remit to build on it. So I guess in the sense that, like if I was painting old masters and then I went to, you know, in the, in the Chinese hmm. paradigm where you'd learn for decades working with the master and you'd learn their techniques and then you'd carry it on and so on. That, I feel like, although there are some artists that obviously influence your work a lot, um, it's a different, the techniques that you use to create the work are generally, well for me anyway, they, they, I, I develop it from scratch. The, the, the way the system works is part of the uniqueness of the artwork. And as you say, part of the, 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 the the challenge and the opportunity is that the techniques are constantly improving, so something yeah. you couldn't do 20 years ago, you probably can do quite easily today. Yeah. So it, it broadens your, your vocabulary, so to speak. It's interesting, one, one of the set of questions I wanted to ask was about, you know, the art world and the movers and shakers and who organise, who are the gatekeepers and all these, these, these phrases, but you, you started off by talking about a company which was developing um, um, movement trackers for animals mm. and how they were interested. Now. Are you, in fact, in, involved in a slightly different thing to the normal art world in that you're getting people to support you who are completely outside the art world and would be quite surprised to be thinking about <laughs> <of> it? <laughs> um, yeah, I think there is an element of that. There is an element of this... Uh, the word is really overused with the idea of innovating with mm. technology and mm. that is of interest to people outside of the art, mm. art world. Mm. And I think, and you see that with, with the, you know, you see that with Apple and Google, mm. the big organisations, they really value technology and art and design. And, you know, even Facebook have got a huge art programme where they have artists working in their offices and stuff like that. And I think it's, I think that's really valuable. Technology, the technology world particularly, you know, can, can see how important maybe it might have used to be called blue sky research and now artists are taking on some of that role in their practice sort of inadvertently because they're having they're pushing the technology that doesn't exist because they're interested in where it's going next when they're looking at the way that the technology is going to impact society and you know and how our lives are affected and to be able to comment on that through an artwork you need to kind of maybe push the technology to do that thing um, so people like Julian Oliver, for instance, put in surveillance stuff in, in, inside a printer mm. that, that, that is scanning everyone's phones when they're in the office. You know, he's commenting on this idea that the everyday object is a surveillance device and, and now you only have to kind of look around at mm. all these personal assistants mm. and they're doing kind of exactly that thing. I mean, you have... Um broaden the normal range of what an artist does, I think. I mean, I remember being very impressed a few years ago when you told me that you'd, you'd been artist in resident for a, a major firm of chartered accountants. Um, um, was it a major firm of chartered accountants? It wasn't. Uh, it was in a nanotechnology centre. Oh, OK, I think right. it's probably yeah. that, yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, I mean, also, you're, you're, you're talking about scientists, you're, you're uh, working with the ODI, you, you give TED talks and all this sort of thing. Um, are you broad? I mean, are you broadening art's reach, or are, are, is art is art still the night job and these are now the day job? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, there's, there there isn't there is no. It's all just one big blur of a job, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's not even a, yeah. Some days it feels like a job when it's admin, but mostly it all everything feeds into each other. So the work mm -hmm. I do at the Open Data Institute at the ODI is very much helps me stay abreast of how people are thinking about data mm. and what it means for, for government, for academia mm. and for, for business. And that, that I find that really interesting, really useful knowledge that kind of folds into my work mm. um, in obtuse ways. I don't think it... There, there's, there's some direct things that I pick up from uh, working with them, but that also I think it works the other way around. So the fact that we have um, a data our program mm. at the ODI helps the people who work there and that we work with see that 
you know, data can be this other thing, not necessarily mm. what they think it is. So it's yeah. kind of, and I'm, that's, that, 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 I'm particularly interested in this idea that data is, like everything else, is, is on a spectrum of not just open and closed data, but it's on a spectrum of truth and falsity. And it's also on a spectrum of being able to be used ethically and immorally. Mm. So it's kind of everything shifts around. I think when you frame it as an art material, then all of a sudden this idea of data as truth can be shelved and you're like, no, data is a material and then we can do what we want with it. Mm. We can manipulate it, we can change it, we can use it directly um, to give evidence, but we can also use it to falsify. So I think it's a case of how you think about it. And for me in my artwork, and doing the curatorial work at these other organisations, that, that helps me to think about things from different perspectives. Okay. You did a PhD on, on uh, data in art, didn't you? I mean, how, how does this fit in with your, your artwork as such? It was really interesting and, um, and really difficult. <laughs> the PhD finally ended up being called um, Defining Data as an Art Material. And it's a, there's quite a lot of theory in there, and I looked at what data, the difference differences between data visualization and data art and again they you know there's they, they sit on a spectrum as well and um, I wanted to understand I wanted to understand the subjectivity in the data flow so the data flow is from the very first point when you're working with data is like why are we collecting data and then you go on to so what are we going to collect how are we going to collect right through the process to how are we analyzing and then how are we communicating our analytical results and at each point in that you know it's a process of many steps but I sort of defined about 15 and at each point there's subjective intervention mm. from the person that's working with them so by the time you've added that up mm. even though the data might be perceived as being objective because it's mm. just values or measurements mm. um, the actual the way it's treated and is completely you know there's a lot of human intervention in that mm. so it's really fascinating so for the PhD I wanted to look at that framework, the data flow, and then I looked at, um, I collected a real-time set of biological data yeah. from um, a colony of naked mole rats. Yeah. So I worked quite closely with a biologist to collect this data. And for me, the data was about generating a live stream of material to work with. Yeah. And for the biologist, it was very much about collecting a live stream so that we could analyse the behaviour of the animals. So it's a really, I was really happy because it's, um, although for me, I was coming from an artistic perspective, uh, for the biologist, it was a very scientific perspective. So it had to be quite rigid the way that we set everything up. Mm. And in amongst all of that, the actual PhD was um, in the computer science department. So it's the uh, disciplines of art, computer science, biology, and also we worked with mathematicians as well. Mm. So it's really uh, cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary. Mm. Um, and then the output, so the, the PhD is very much about the sort of the theory and thinking about all that, and then also practically um, creating an artwork, an abstract animation and soundscape, creating data visualizations, mm. creating, um, doing analysis on the behaviour data, so generating graphs yeah. and stuff, <laughs> which is normally what I avoid, but I really love doing it. Yeah. And then analysing the data, and then we use some sort of Markov chain modelling yeah. to look at predictability of the animals. And then also created, um, commissioned a photographer to make some sort of conceptual artworks with me that looked at the idea of data privacy in animals. So it kind of, there's one set of data, and it's it sort of like spawned all of these different things, mm. you know, different artworks, conceptual, direct artworks, mm. design work, visualisation, and then analysis mm. for biology as well. So it's a really rich, for me, it's a really rich landscape mm. of things that you could do with data, but it all begins at one point. And the point is that data set, and then stepping back from that is the colony of, yeah. of animals. Yeah. So all of this is about how we're connecting to yeah. um, something from the natural world. If, if I'm coming to this completely cold as a, as a member of the public, how would I encounter your this as an artwork? So the, the, the project is the project's called Rat.Systems, which yeah. is Rodent Activity Transmission Systems, and it's encountered... 
a with fortune them. Yeah. With them. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. So lucky with that. Um, the so the audience can encounter it in different ways. So it's on. There's an online element to it, so that you can just see the website, um, which is fine. And then also, really interestingly, we displayed it in different artistic places as well as different science and technology places. So we had it. Um, on display at Somerset House, where you could see the photographs, you could experience the animation and the sound, and you could browse the visualisation. Mm. And then you could also see um, these small soft robotic sculptures that moved in relation to the animal movement as well. Mm. So there's a lot of physical elements as well as the screen-based stuff. Um, and that was at Somerset House, it was also at FACT in Liverpool, but it was a, a big installation. Um, so for the sort of art and technology audience or just the art audience we covered that but then also we showed the whole thing at New Scientist Live which yeah. is the science fair and so for New Scientist Live we had we actually had the animals there as well at some of these events so you could come and see the animals and then the sculptures and the animation and so on as well so we hit loads of different audiences yeah. and depending on who you're talking to so the art world will tend to look at things from a sort of a more conceptual angle or the bigger picture yeah. and then at the new scientist live fair people were like what well, so how do the robots work yeah. can i see what's behind so i ended up just uncovering in an artistic context i would hide the back-end technology yeah. i didn't want people to see the motors and the, the syringe drivers and stuff it was like a, a pneumatic system and then in the, in the science fair, I just exposed everything because they just want to see, mm. you know, how things are working. And that's really interesting for me. So the, although, it, it, for me, the whole thing is an artwork because I'm coming at it as an artist. Mm. Um, but actually, it spans across creating art, doing public engagement of science, mm. putting the animals in front of people so that they can actually see them, um, showing that data can be used in different ways. So it's, it's, you know, it's huge. And I think back to your question about whether art, whether this kind of art and technology is expanding the art world, mm. maybe in these, in these, with these kind of projects, which are really far reaching in different disciplines, I think maybe they do, mm. you know. Um, but the important bit is that because I'm, I see myself as an artist. And so everything I do is with, it, with that intention. Mm. I suppose the, the elephant in the room is, is, is the question of money. Uh, and, and perhaps if I can ask the question this way, when you want to p produce an artwork, do you just go ahead and do it, or do you have to sit down first and start worrying about sponsorship and whether you can actually get, get it paid for and get the money for it? Yeah, no, I, the, the, it is a bit of the elephant in the room, but I, my, all, the ideas come, come first and they'll come randomly. And then I'll, I'll write them up so there'll be documents on my computer or I'll make a, a, a blog post or stick it in my research notebooks. And then I'll develop the idea over, over time. I'm a really, there's a really slow lead in to all of my projects. None of them, pretty much no, none of them are kind of like, I've got an idea, let's do it in, in a short space of time. I, th I think they're all, it's a minimum of a year and some of them, the, the lake project was eight years from the first prototype to f finally getting enough funding to get it, do it done on a sort of scale that I wanted to. Um, I think with, with We Need Us, another big project, that was another sort of, that was a six month run in for that from the time I first encountered the data set that I wanted to work with. And that's quite quick for me. <coughs> but the project I'm working on at the moment is I looked up the um, the first date when I wrote the first stuff down, where I had like a, I guess the key inspiration moment, and that was 2010, so that's already, yeah. already there's a long time, and that's, that one is now only just coming to fruition, partly because um, in terms of ideas, not, I haven't started making it yet, but I think partly the PhD took a chunk of time out of there. But in terms of money, I never think about how would, um, how would I fund it until I've got to a point where I'm like, I really, I need to make this, I need to make this happen. And then it becomes a, a bit of an obsession where I'll start talking about it to people and, and, and kind of see where it will fit in, who would be interested, um, and then how it can be made. So I think there's some obvious things like the Arts Council, but then you need some match funding, so you need a partner to be able to do that. 
Um, and I, yeah, I, it's really hard. M more often than not, something serendipitous will happen. Mm. So you'll meet someone who's curating a show the following year and they've got some funding and then you can raise your own funding. Um, but generally with my projects, none of them are particularly cheap. So they either involve quite complicated <coughs> software, which and the, the sort of, a lot of the heavy JavaScript stuff I work with, I, someone else does it for me. It's kind of beyond my skills. Um, or it involves really expensive equipment. Mm. So the tracking systems for animals are really expensive. Every single sensor in the mole rat project was um, about 300 quid. And then you've got the tags and then the, yeah, the server space and stuff like that. So all of a sudden to do anything on a biggish scale, it ramps up completely. I think for, um, oh, I don't know, with, with there are new forms of, of funding stuff that I haven't particularly tried, like crowdfunding or using a Patreon account where people can donate <coughs> monthly to help you with your creative outputs. But I think one of the issues with my work is that they take so long. Oh. And then at the end, they're not, I mean, you could sell maybe prints. Oh. And I've sold prints in, in the past. Oh. Um, to sell something that uses real time biological data I have no control over when the animals are going to die. Often with the animal tracking, it involves a tag, and a tag has a battery life that is going to expire. So for someone to buy a piece of work like that, it becomes really tricky because it's really ephemeral, or what they're buying is, even if you set it up exactly as the real-time one existed in the first place, you'd still be using archival data. And so then you're buying, you might be buying the installation, but you're actually buying the sort of it's not the documentation but it's also not the real work because it's not live I don't know what it sits somewhere in between mm. like an archived version of, of the real thing so if money is really hard from that perspective in terms of sales in a regular gallery it's really difficult there's obviously things that um, and I've been thinking about this more and more actually is about how I could work with multiples and what that would mean mm. Um, so for the mole rat project, we produce a load of socks. Socks. <laughs> mole rat socks that people really liked. But I just gave them away. I couldn't bring myself to sell them. So we just gave them away. Um, but I think, yeah, it's hard. I, 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 I don't know. I think some, some people maybe think about making something that is saleable. Mm. And that's just in their practice naturally. Mm. Um, and I did have, I did do a load of particular um, prints from a nanotechnology, uh, a nanotechnology project, and we got them printed and framed, and one of those sold one of those um, big artworks. But there, for me, making those static objects is quite a challenge mm. because my natural, mm. uh, my natural work wants to be alive. Mm. So either I'm dealing directly with the the death part of the technology. And that has to be a, a conscious, an integral part of the art concept. Or I'm dealing with a li li aliveness and something that is, has life, which means that a, a static object doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, have, have you ever thought of a project and then had to say, no, I'm sorry, I just can't get anybody to support that, I won't do it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, there are there are there are some in the there are some in the background that are still kind of kind of like one day someone will let me do that, mm. and so they so they exist. But I would never, you know, if there's something, it, I'm a bit like a terrier. If I really want to make something, I find it really difficult to let go, and so or I'll just push and push, and one day the technology will catch up and I'll be able to do it, which happens, or um, someone at some point will will kind of. Um, cave in and go, no, actually, let's, we really need to do this. But really, it's, but, it's all about reputation and networking, isn't it, in a sense? Yeah, although, yeah, I think, you know, being, having a track record, mm. reputation and having a track record, kind of mm. two different things. I think, yeah, tra <coughs> yes. the more you do, the more seriously you're, you push your work forward, then that um, definitely helps. Um, but it takes a really long time. So I think of, you know, like Christo, uh, and John Claude and their their works. Some of them are twenty more years in the. In, they have the idea, and it takes them that long to get the permissions and the and the the finances and stuff like that. 
And I, I really love that slow burn idea that you can have an idea and it doesn't have to happen immediately. And I think because of... Um, it's interesting that the data visualisation world is very much, is a much quicker sort of turnaround for stuff. And so I almost feel like backing away from that to go back to the, these the big projects that are slower are, are interesting. And you involve a lot of people and becomes a team effort and it becomes, the process of it is just as interesting in getting it to happen as it is to make the work and then the final output. So there's these three distinct phases of a project and all of them to me are part of my kind of artistic practice mm. the hustle mm. if you like and then the process of making it come together and the excitement of seeing it when it does actually work and then the putting it in front of audiences and and or putting it online wherever it's going to be and then seeing it um seeing people respond to it so they're th they're three chunks and some people only see a small part of that depending on if I'm working with them or they're a funder, or they're a, an audience, or a participant. But for me, it's the, the whole process is important. How do you um, distinguish between types of between good data art and, and what you might call deriv derivative data art, and indeed between data art and, and, and visualization, data visualization? Julia, a, a lot of your work is well, all of your work really could be called data art in a sense. Data art is, 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 is quite, um, becoming quite fashionable in a way. Um, how do you, uh, uh, what criteria can one use to distinguish between good data art and, say, derivative data art? Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. This, is, I mean, this, is, this is really interesting to me. It's really interesting to me because I find that there's a lot of uh, what people, other people may call data art that I would definitely call data visualisation. Mm -hmm. And I might call it artistic data visualisation, which is to say it looks beautiful, but it also serves a purpose. And I think the difference for me, one of the key differences is, is it trying to um, be, create an experience or say something um, interesting about data or about the context of how it like, affects and re reflects our lives? Or is it giving you some information about that data set that helps you gain knowledge through that information? Mm. And I think if it's the <coughs> latter, then it's, you're looking at data visualisation. It can look as lovely as you like, but um, is its purpose to kind of give a, a particular piece of information? Because I don't think artworks necessarily do that. You know, there needs to be... For me, anyway, there needs to be a step that I can take on my own, which is where you need ambiguity or suggestion or, you know, you need to be able to fill in your own narrative to a certain extent. And the problem is that a really good data visualisation shouldn't allow for that because it should be really clear. Excellent design should be really clear in, in the message that it's getting across. And what's happened is that those two things have got kind of muddled up because there's some really beautiful design. Um, that does exactly that and should be held up for people to say, look, this is really amazing, but not necessarily aligned as a piece of data art in a kind of more fine art context. And um, so it's difficult on my work particularly, and I think my work is not very, it's not popular in certain, in certain realms, data visualization kind of realms particularly, because it's it's not exacting. Mm. It uses data in a in a in a sort of um, in in a in a way that adds a, a dynamic, but it doesn't give you particular information about what any information that is contained in that data set. So with the mole rats, you can see that they're kind of moving and shifting, and it gives you the 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 essence, um, or it's you know the, it expresses the data in some way. And that's what, exactly what it's supposed to be doing. And even um, with a project called We Need Us, it's the same thing. You know that there's live data happening, but you don't know exactly what it is or who's doing it or where they're doing it from, even though that's the data that is making the, the, the compositions animate. And so it's, it, feel, it, it, it lands in between people saying, well, it's not very good data visualisation because I don't understand what's going on. So there's a fail in that box. And then when you look at it as a piece of artwork, 
people are judging it by data visualization mm. rules or by art rules and they're saying yeah but it looks like data viz so it's not an artwork mm. so it's kind of funny it's in this it's place in between it's, it's, a, it's a very good point I mean there's a lot of data visualization around and as you say some of it is very good indeed and it is difficult sometimes it, it I think it almost comes back to the, the difference between art and design yeah. Yeah, I mean art is when you follow your own design brief and design is when you follow somebody else's perhaps but um, perhaps it's, it's something on those lines I don't know um, I always feel sorry mm. for naked mole rats. I feel they must be cold <laughs> and embarrassed. <laughs> they're kept in a, in a heated room there, right, yeah. I don't think they're yeah, embarrassed. It's hilarious. Why did, why did you choose naked mole rats? Just, I mean, are they just scientifically convenient? Well, they? Why? They're, well, they're, um, I met the, uh, one of the, there's a world sort of expert naked mole rat keeper at mm -hmm. Queen Mary where I was doing my mm -hmm. PhD. And I met him in the, in the tea room and we had a great conversation about... Um, freeze dryers for taxidermy purposes right. and then I said to him and I thought this is a deal you know this is kind of like it's going to make or break this conversation I said oh I've got some small mammals in my freezer that I'd like to freeze dry because they're too small to taxidermy and I looked at him and I was thinking he's that here love just completely freak out and he just went yeah I've got small mammals in my freezer as well <laughs> and we had this really nice moment and uh but it, he turned out he had naked mole rats because um, they uh, in the lab when they're alive he looks at the behaviour mm. but when they die he's allowed to then kind of take biopsies mm. and stuff and explore them and look at the sort of genetic mm. makeup of them I so see yeah why you referred to serendipity earlier on it's, it's, it's obviously played quite an important role in your yeah career. yeah well, with that with the mole rat project particularly <coughs> there's been loads of serendipitous uh, meetings although a case you know you kind of Sometimes I put myself in the situations where that might happen. Mm. So you can sort of, sh you know, shift stuff along a bit. But that particular meeting was really, was really great. And when I said what I was after is like a live feed mm. of animal data. And then Chris, uh, Dr. Chris Falk said, yeah, well, I've got all of these animals. Mm. And it was really, yeah, it was a really perfect moment. Mm. And we've worked together now for probably four years mm. doing this stuff. So it's been a slow a slow development but the project's been really successful mm. and um, it's still ongoing there's still quite a lot to to do we've we've got an awful lot of data mm. now we've got about 10 million naked mole rat data points <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like this stuff so I've amassed a load of material which yes. I'm really pleased about we were talking about alternative forms of funding do you think sponsorship by companies is is, is a, a growing uh, uh, opportunity yeah, I, I think I think it really could be. Yeah. I, the thing is, with when you're working with technology, there's always a, a chance that it will um, that you'll develop something or you'll stumble <coughs> across something that could be useful yeah. in in the commercial world or um, could be useful in the sort of hu for humanitarian yeah. reasons or in healthcare, something like that. That just you know a piece of technology that might just trigger that, which would suggest to me that it'd be if the if companies were interested in supporting the, the, the digital arts. What often happens with sort of corporate social responsibility programs, mm. they'll support some artwork for their office. So they'll look at it as a decorative thing mm. or they'll support some kind of activity or event which turns into a team building thing. Mm. But I think, you know, if there could be a, if we could set a precedent, if we could sort of get the information out there to them that working with digital artists could benefit their research mm and development mm. agendas, mm. then that would be really interesting, it's a really interesting crossover and mm. something that could, I mean, arts funding is definitely sort of dwindling. The Arts Council are great, but there's just, you know, not enough mm. money for all the people that want to mm. develop projects. Mm. And, um, and it seems to come with a lot of bureaucracy too, doesn't it? I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of metrics and measurements mm. and evaluations mm. and, and mm. things like that, and you do, there is a lot of those kind of hoops to jump through, mm. which actually, when you're an independent artist, filling in an Arts Council application is a significant investment mm. because it's a big chunk of your time. Mm. And also, you might not get it and you might get minimal feedback. Mm. Um, and so, it, it, yeah, it takes a lot. And it's really hard when you know that people are salaried and they're sort of, you know, they're going through this and they're saying, no, you've got to, you've got to mm. do this kind of evaluation and that kind of stuff. And you're like, well... I can make the work and I know I can get a good audience, but I'm, and I'm lucky because I feel like I'm 
I have the ability to do that because I can schedule and budget and I have got some sort of business skills from coming from a really entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial background. But it still takes time. But it still takes time, but some artists just don't have that capacity. Mm. It's just mm. overwhelming for them. Mm. And, mm. you know, so it's almost, it's a bit self-selecting in that way. It's like who can put in an application mm. for the people that do and those that don't just you know, can't, and they're having mm. to look elsewhere, and that's mm. that's tricky. Do you think that situation is going to get worse? I mean, the government does seem to be so much by objectives these days that, you know, <laughs> the, the, all this sort of having to justify a, a, an application on various non-artistic grounds uh, mm. can only, seems to me, can only get, get worse in a way. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that eventually that people will stop, stop collecting mm. data and mm. stop trying to judge everything, mm. because it just, you know, sometimes it mm. sucks the life Mm. out of what's really happening mm. and if you want to you know sometimes things don't need to be made you know you can measure something but if you change one per you can say I've, mm. 2,000 people saw this <laughs> performance mm. and they all thought it was great or you can say five people saw this performance one of those people it really changed their lives and then they've gone off and done mm. some amazing things in mm. whatever discipline they work mm. with that is much more valuable than 2,000 people going yeah I had a nice time tonight mm. But if you're you going to a, you know, a, a non-governmental that. source like a, like a company, I mean, how does one start doing that? Yeah, you build up contacts, presumably. It's, it's no easy way. No, but it's tricky. But I think you could build it into your, you know, like there's research and development. There's, mm. there's HR development, profession, personal and professional development. Mm. There's various schemes and stuff. And it mm. wouldn't be particularly difficult to um, set up a programme within your organisation mm that allows artists to come in and do that. And yes, some will go wrong. Some mm. will just be a nightmare and it won't work. Mm. But then, but on the whole, like any kind of uh, slightly risky mm. investment, then some good things will come out of it. Do but, you see um, a role for sort of artistic organisations, if you like, like the Computer Arts Society and doing that sort of thing? Yeah, massively. I mean, they could be, I think organisations like CAS could be a massive, mm have a massive role to play in advocacy. Yes. If they understand, I mean, the research you're doing is really valuable from that perspective because they could really um, be a point where if an organisation wants to work with artists who are working with computers, digital technology, mm. if they could go to someone and say, you know, what are the potential benefits? Mm. What are the potential risks? Mm. You know, who can we get hold of? Mm. How, how can we work with them? Um, and if they're an organisation that could, could help bridge that gap mm. bet bet between business and artists or mm. between academics and artists mm. or whatever it might be mm. to smooth that process over then I think it'd be really helpful because mm. it doesn't I can't think of anyone that really does that there's arts and business but they're very business mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, and they, they do have a different agenda mm. it does seem I mean it, it People know people, but that, uh, it, that's not rationally spread about. Some people know some people, not others. <coughs> it's very much a series of little silos, isn't it? Yeah. And there would be some, if there was some sort of central organisation that could, uh, I don't know, I'm coming up with my ideas now. Yeah, that's, not why uh, I'm here. After, that's <laughs> after your Masters. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I think that's... that's been a very helpful is that in, enough? interview to you. Yeah. I, 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 are, are there any questions I should have asked you and haven't? Uh, no, I can't, I, don't, I can't think of any. Okay. Julie Freeman, thank you very much. <laughs>